Okay, thank you. Well, my name is Glenn Grant. I'm a uh, defence expert and I work here in Ukraine about 10 days a month uh, trying to help the military with uh, everything from um, uh, understanding how to fight Russia to uh, things like rehabilitation. Um, and rehabilitation is really, it's a, a vital and complex issue <clears throat> and it's, it's growing more complex. I think if you go back and you take an army um, from maybe 17 or 1800s, then rehabilitation wasn't so much a subject because people came out of society and went back to the same society that they'd come from when they, when they went to war. But this doesn't happen anymore. Um, people don't have a, a necessarily a society uh, to go back to. They come from a street. They may not know anybody in the street when they join the army and they, then when they finish, they go back to, effectively, back to nowhere. This is a real problem because without the, the sort of society to go to, without the family, without the village, without the, uh, the support system, then people are left on their own a lot. Um, and it, it appears that from, from, um, from Great Britain, from America, and from here in Ukraine, that having a, a ministry for veterans doesn't work. Uh, and I think that this is because it, it, it's separated mentally from the defence ministry, which is where actually people spend their life when they're working in defence. And you can't have a, a separate ministry because it doesn't have the same mental uh, link to the soldiers and the same understanding as the soldiers. In, certainly, if you go to America, then there is huge unhappiness with the, uh, with the veterans ministry in a way that it actually just does not help people when they, uh, when they leave. And of course, America, I mean, it has such huge numbers uh, of people leaving every year that it's, it's really, really difficult to, to, to understand this. Uh, and I think that what, what this means is that you've got to have a system within the defense system running all the time that actually looks at uh, completely w w what, what is going to happen when people leave. And so that, that from the time that they arrive to the time that they leave the army or Air Force or Navy, there has to be something that actually is preparing them for that day, that they will go on operations, that they will have a hard time, but they will leave. I mean, you leave the army, you only leave the army in two ways. You either leave at the end of your time or you leave dead. And, and and it's those that, that, that are going to leave at the end of their time have to be prepared for. Now, if you go to the Ukrainian Ministry of Defence, there is nothing in the Ministry of Defence about preparing people to leave at all. If you go to the British Ministry of Defence, then there is a lot of thinking about this and always has been, making sure that you have proper amount of money when you leave, uh, you have pre preparation for leaving. It's not much. My, as an officer, I had seven weeks. Um, four weeks of which I spent uh, in Estonia uh, learning to do an advisor's job. So that's the, and the, and the government paid, British government paid for my flights, for my hotels, and for my time in Estonia while I learned that, that trade. And then, uh, and then I left the army and, and, and went and did an advisor's job. Um, and soldiers get slightly less, but there is this preparation and there is some uh, you could call it psychological preparation and practical preparation for being a civilian. Because when, when people are actually in the army and they're away, nobody really prepares them for the simple things of life. Talking to civilians, the fact that people don't understand your language anymore, they don't understand what you've been through, they don't care what you've been through. And so this is really important now as, as operations are getting, I think operations are getting nastier and nastier in many ways. I mean, when I went to war in Northern Ireland, it was quite a simple war, I would say. It was simple, but things are not simple anymore because, because people leave bombs on the floor. They leave bombs everywhere. You can, you can die at any time when you're on operations and, and you see your friends blown up. I actually ran the British military prison uh, and one of the things that was quite interesting um, and worrying for me was that inside the prison we had a lot of people who were suffering from trauma from operations. 
And after the first Gulf War, um, in the prison, at one time, I had three soldiers from the same vehicle. So they'd been on operations, on war, three of them at the same time, who'd all been officially disobedient. But actually, what we were looking at was a mental cry for help because they'd seen their colleagues killed in the next vehicle. And so there was nothing in the system to actually to deal with this, this cry for help. Um, and we have to prepare people better all the way through. And the system, the ministries of defense have to spend money or have the money allocated not to another ministry, but to them to, pre to create things that work not only preparing people for leaving, but preparing them before they go on operations of what is going to happen. And I was fortunate to, to see this and to, to have this in Britain, where people talked about, before we went, they talked about death. They talked about death and it's going to happen to someone and you have to be mentally prepared for it. What does it mean? What does it mean in terms of talking to wives and children? What does it mean in terms of friends? Uh, and, and so we actually sort of like prepared each other for this, which, which meant that when these things happened, they were not so, yeah, you can never prepare people for death, I'm sorry, but you can't. But at least you can make 50% of the way so that it's not a, so much of a shock. In British Army, we're very helped by having a very strong um, religious uh, tone and very, very high quality um, church people working inside the system. So in the officers' mess that I lived in in Germany, we had a padre who lived in the mess with us. And that, that was really quite good because all the time when you were talking about difficult things, you always had someone who could bring a different perspective and a different thinking uh, to what you did. I think the other thing that we were, we're very fortunate in Britain is we have this phenomenal, uh, in the military, this phenomenal uh, level of sport in the system. And, and a lot of concentration on sport and um, I'm going to say hobbies, but I don't really mean hobbies. So people take things like fishing seriously. And then what happens is that when people go away on operations, the conversation on the operation is not about worrying, it's about what we're going to do, what we're going to win when we go back, what sport we've got when we go back, what competitions are we going to do, are we going to win the army championships next year? Or something of that sort. So the boys have always got something to talk about, not to be inwards looking themselves. And we have so much sport that virtually every single soldier in a unit is involved in something. He's either in the football team or he's the coach or he's the ball boy or he's going on a, a badminton course when he gets back or something of this sort. And that, that network of of, of relationships is also very strong because it means that all the soldiers come up against officers uh, in their spare time. So they're not actually just soldier stratas of soldiers, sergeants and officers. There is these vertical stratas from sport and hobbies that mean that the relationships are much, much stronger uh, and much more complex and well-developed than you would see otherwise in other armies. And the, the Americans have gone in and out of this. They've, they dabble in sport, but they don't quite understand the, the, the strength of having friends in the Navy and in the Army and in the Air Force who are all doing the same sport as you. And now, I mean, I've left 15, 16 years. My Facebook is full of all my sporting friends from the Army, Navy and Air Force who did the same sports as me and my soldiers who did the same sports as me. So even when, after they've been on operations, they still have a fundamental link to me as their officer 20, 30 years onwards. And that, those things are absolutely wonderful for rehabilitation because it means that the soldier does not feel that he's lost. Now, our, we have very, we're growing more NGOs in Britain. I know they're growing more NGOs for this subject in America as well. And in Britain, a lot of my officer colleagues uh, are now running NGOs for rehabilitation, purely for rehabilitation and purely for soldiers that have left and have got, have got problems. Because no matter how good we are in Britain, 
or were, there are still a lot of ex-soldiers in prison. And it's the same thing, they, 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 they can't deal with life, they end up on doing stupid crimes, uh, taking drugs often to, to, to take away the stress, and they end up in prison, or they end up committing suicide. And we've been working, a lot of my friends now are working hard in Britain with these NGOs to try and cut those numbers and to, to identify the people that are, that are at risk. But the, it's interesting, I think probably the strongest thing that we have now is Facebook. Is Facebook and the Facebook groups of units where people are looking after each other. So if you go onto a, you go onto a unit Facebook in Britain, like 13 battery, 22 battery from the artillery, the boys are looking for each other. And you can go on there on any day and they're asking, have you seen so-and-so? Does anybody know where so-and-so is? Because we haven't heard from him for a year or two years. So this is, this, this, it's the most remarkable um, improvement in these things. Now, talking about today and what I've seen today, I think this is really important to have rehabilitation through art and rehabilitation through, through, through anything, frankly. And art is as good as a subject as any, where you bring people together, you get them to express themselves, and I think most importantly, to find friends, to find other people that are the same. And I think that's the important thing, is that when you've got people with problems, they need to be able to turn to someone quickly who has a common idea, common feeling, common understanding. It's, they mustn't be alone. And, uh, and that how you make sure that you capture everybody, this needs to be done in the defence ministry before they leave, not afterwards. That would be my big message.